Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank uh, AMRO and the ADBI Institute for organizing this very important uh, forum on the financial uh, stability. Our session two will uh, tackle the issue soaring debt and financial stress, implications for ASEAN plus three's financial stability. And our session two notes are spot on. Total non-financial debt has steadily risen in ASEAN plus three economies since the global financial crisis. And the magnitudes are roughly in the vicinity of advanced economies. Nothing is patently wrong with borrowing per se, especially if this is supportive of economic growth. But if excessive and rapidly accumulating debt, financial stability may be compromised. To the extreme, high public debt could affect the country's credibility among global investors. We agree completely with our friend Eddie Yue from HKMA that indeed, the debt issue is both old and new. Old in that we have gone through it and given birth to our local currency bonds and the multilateralized Chiang Mai Initiative. New in that it was the pandemic that motivated the significant increase in both corporate and household debt complicated by demographic challenges and higher demand for public support. This afternoon, we shall listen to our experts from both the IFIs, think tanks, central bank, and finance ministry. We will have some key background on this financial challenge, some global perspective, focus on sectoral impact, and the experience and policy options faced by the authorities in the region. So <clears throat> we will begin with Kevin. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Diwa. So uh, my presentation below uh, is based on the thematic chapter. It's not showing. Presentation, please. Oh. Okay, so thank you very much, Diwa. So my presentation will be based on the thematic chapters of the AFSL just launched this morning, entitled Navigating High Debt in Low Visibility. So um, let us begin with a chart uh, showing a general debt landscape for the ASEAN plus three and other regions. Uh, here in the screen, we can see that red is a public debt, gray is household debt, green is non-financial corporate debt. And the key message is that non-financial debt has steadily increased in ASEAN plus three countries since the GFC. Debt level began to surpass that of advanced economies in the middle of 2010s and experienced a further surge during the pandemic to the peak of 325% of GDP. In contrast to other economies that see the debt level falling back to the pre-pandemic level in 2020. Two, the region continued to see the debt at elevated level at around 300% of GDP, which is significantly be beyond the pandemic, pre-pandemic level. The accumulation of debt is more driven by the private debt, which is household and corporate together. So public debt is increasing considerably in the region as well, but broadly speaking, uh, public debt grows at a slower rate than private debt. Now, within private debt, it is corporate debt that has grown more noticeably. The corporate debt to GDP has reached approximately 140%, notably higher than in Europe and in North America. And household debt has also grown rapidly as well, and is now approaching uh, the levels in advanced economies. So, of course, when we dig deeper, we can see a high degree of heterogeneity among the economies. While some economies are pressured by public debt, some are pressured by corporate debt, some are pressured by uh, household debt. Specifically, Korea and Thailand have a higher household debt. Housing mortgages generally play a big role in the accumulation of household debt. 
and Hong Kong, China, Singapore, and Korea have higher corporate debt in the region. The debt to GDP ratios of international financial centers such as Hong Kong and Singapore are noticeably higher because they are also financing for other, reg uh, other economies. In terms of government debt, Japan, Japan remains an outlier in the region. However, risk to the public debt remains mitigated by uh, the large government asset, uh, the fact that uh, Japanese yen is a safe haven, strong external sector, and also limited bond holdings by foreigners. Now, let us assess some of the debt vulnerabilities. First, start with the household debt. The left chart, uh, the left chart shows the household debt picture specifically shows the debt servicing ability of household borrower by estimating the DSRs. The results suggest that the estimated debt burden appear manageable in the region. In the report, we also estimate, uh, uh, also uh, simulate uh, uh, a higher uh, the DSR impact, assuming a further 200 basis point increase, a further 200 basis point increase in interest rate and the result also suggests that there's only modest increase in DSL. In addition to the uh, DSL, the, in the AFSL, we also study other dimension of household debt, which is the house prices. Um, our, and our analysis shows that house prices have declined in the region and is now closer to the fundamental values estimated by some fundamental uh, model meaning that there's now less room for a major correction in the period ahead. Then now, let's turn on the corporate debt, which is in the middle chart. Uh, here, we are running a simple simulation by shocking the interest coverage ratio, which is defined as EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes, divided by interest expense. Now, if we consider cash buffer, we can also add cash to the EBIT in the numerator, while no cash buffer only have EBIT in the numerator. So the first two bars show the actual ICR or interest coverage ratio with or without considering cash buffer at the end of 2022. The red, both red and lighter red segments are the percent of firms struggling with that repayment, defined as in having an ICR below 1.25. So we, the result shows that in 2022, it's about 40% of firms will have ICR uh, below 1.25. Now, if we present the same data in terms of debt instead of percent of firms, as was done in the uh, press conference an hour ago, we show a better picture, uh, only 20% of the debt uh, would be at risk. Now, why is it there's a difference? Why is 40% here and 20% uh, there if you look at the percent of debt? The reason is that uh, our report also shows that most of the debt in the region goes to stronger and financially viable firms. So if you look at the number of debt, it's only 20% at risk. But if you look at the number of uh, firms at risk, it's about 40%. Because these are, most of them are weaker firms. So that's half. Yeah, half, you have a business uh, consider. So the, the, the real impact is only 20%. Because like 40% uh, among some of the, 40% uh, some of them are really, really small potatoes and don't have a systemic uh, impact. So, um, so it's good and bad, and I can explain later from a financial stability uh, perspective it's good, but from a social welfare it's not good because all the uh, uh, financing goes to the stronger, uh, firm, but in any case, whether we are showing the number of firms, this is this the one we see is a worse picture. If we consider cash buffers, we can see that the cash that they are holding, actually the same forty percent will drop significantly to about five percent, meaning that even those weaker firms have a lot of cash on hand, so the cash can help make that uh, payment, that payment. So, the bottom line here is that. Uh, the corporate in the region can withstand interest rate in English shocks. Because first, number one, most of the debt go to the stronger, bigger firms. Okay, so if you term in terms of debt, it's much smaller. 
But even you consider the bigger, the, the smaller and weaker firms, they also have good cash. So if they consider the cash that are holding, they're also okay as well. So they meaning that it show a good uh, situation here. And then the right hand side chart examines the so-called sovereign bank nexus, which was mentioned by the two keynote speakers, uh, where the value of government bond uh, held by the bank could drop because interest rate uh, may increase. So for example, Silicon Valley Bank collapsed partly due to the sharp drop in the value of US treasuries uh, due to the high interest rate. So here we are conducting a stress test to look at the impact of bond yield on bank resilience. And the result shows that banks will still maintain sufficient capital under adverse mm. conditions. Uh, specifically, our uh, findings indicate that a 100 basis point increase in bond yield would uh, bank, uh, so cost, capital adequacy ratio uh, would still exist significantly, comfortably above the Basel three minimum levels. Furthermore, the AFSL, not shown here, also investigate the public debt structure. And we find the Ashen Plus 3 have very sound public debt structure. And, and this debt structure actually help limit the risk in relation to interest rates as a debt are primarily fixed rate and also exchange rate because most of the debt are issued in local currency. And as well as financing, as a debt uh, the, uh, in the, the, the remaining maturity is also longer for uh, the region than, than elsewhere. Uh, and also the share of foreign investor in public debt is also smaller uh, in the region than elsewhere. Then now, now let's turn to the financial intermediary, which can also be affected by higher debt as interest rate increase. So as shown in the left chart, Ashen plus three is still a region dominated by banks, although MBFI have grown in prominence in recent years. In particular, the AFSL find that the role of MBFI as a provider of dollar liquidity has increased in Ashland Plus 3 enormously over the past few years, and recently surpassed those by uh, banks in selected Ashland Plus 3 economies. And on the right hand side, we're looking at the impact of higher interest on bank loan books. Here, we are simulating how a 100 basis point increase in interest rate would affect the MPL. By a panel regression, we established a relationship between MPL and interest rate. And the result is also good, suggesting that a 100 basis point increase in interest rate would only uh, increase MPL by up to 1.5 basis point, which would still mean that MPL in the region will remain significantly lower than their peers in other regions. More importantly, I want to note that high interest rates are not necessarily bad news for banks because high interest rates could also uh, boost their uh, bank profitability. profitability By the way, Kevin, I forgot to remind our speakers that uh, we are limited to 10 minutes. Okay, 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 let me just finish. Okay. I, I have 20 seconds, I'll finish. Okay. So, um, so in that case, if, for example, the, the profitability can, can boost if their net interest margin increase because they can pass on the uh, rate to the borrowers and also keep the deposit rate constant. So the key takeaway is that high interest rate would still uh, not hurt the MPL of the banks, but may actually boost their uh, 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 profitability yeah. further. Mm. And that is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. It's good to hear that uh, <clears throat> it looks like uh, the households are the ones more vulnerable. Uh, the household uh, sector appears to be suffering from uh, lower housing prices. Mm -hmm. But for both uh, corporates and uh, public debt, mm -hmm. I think the situation is more manageable. Mm -hmm. And interest rate, uh, high interest rate is not necessarily bad because it cuts both ways. Yeah. Uh, it, cuts, it cuts into uh, their costs. Uh, there, is, there is higher costs because they have to pay higher interest, mm -hmm. but it could also increase their profitability in yeah. terms of interest uh, income. Right. Thank you very much, uh, you. Kevin. We now move on to John. Thank you, Tiwa. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here on this panel on this very important topic. Um, with this intervention, I'd like to discuss the global implications of debt sustainability risks in the ASEAN region 
as well as um, some of the implications that this would have for global investors in the region and the resulting financial stability risks. So I think you know we're all very aware of the large buildup in debt that had taken place in the low interest rate envir environment prior to the pandemic, which increased further during the pandemic, of course. Um, and you know this has created some vulnerability to a, a change in interest rates, and that's what we've seen recently. Um, so since March 2022, as everybody is aware, uh, the U.S. has increased interest rates by 500 basis points. Um, due to the risks related to inflation, which will persist for some time, leading to this uh, longer um, period of uh, high in interest rates and, and some persistence in inflation in the US. Um, now, the, the question is, how is this affecting uh, Asia? How is it affecting other emerging markets? Well, there's the direct effect via the interest rate channel, whereby as a result of um, the US increasing interest rates, central banks in emerging markets are also forced to increase their own interest rates in order to mitigate net capital outflows and mitigate the effect on the exchange rate and therefore mitigate some of the imported inflation that would be the result of that. The other effect, of course, is via the exchange rate channel. And this is a particular problem for economies that have large shares of dollar-denominated debt because, of course, one of the results of um, tightening U.S. rates is a strengthening of the dollar. Um, the dollar is at a very high level now, historically, uh, and this puts pressure on those economies that have high shares of dollar-denominated debt, and it can even push them to an unsustainable level of that debt. Um, we, we heard earlier about the non-bank finance sector um, being one of the sources of this external debt, and, and this is a real risk um, in the Asian context, I, I feel, um, given that there is somewhat less regulation here and, and somewhat uh, more unknowns in terms of um, the real exposure of, of this debt. Um, so that's the story on um, the implications of tightening uh, US rates uh, on, on Asian markets and the implications that it have, can have for debt sustainability. Um, another important issue, I feel, um, which was touched on uh, earlier, is the sovereign debt, sovereign bank nexus, which is um, perhaps not a uh, amplified risk at, at, this, at this juncture, but it's something that needs to be monitored very closely uh, in the Asian context. I think that, you know, as debt has built up, a large portion of this has been held by banks in the region, so any um, increase in, in stress on the sovereign side would clearly spill over to the financial side, uh, and this would have repercussions throughout the financial system. Um, another risk which is perhaps less discussed is um, Okay, we know about the development of local currency bond markets, particularly in ASEAN. It's been very successful for addressing currency mismatches and also maturity mismatches. But I think that what's a less touched upon risk is the foreign investor participation in these markets. And this has grown significantly over the past 20 years, particularly in the low interest rate environment when foreign investors were you know, seeking to uh, you know, get higher returns. Um, we're now in a reverse scenario whereby we're in a high interest rate environment, but should that turn down the line to a lower interest rate environment, then we could see some shifting investor uh, behavior in local currency bond markets, whereby they could shift out of those markets abruptly. Um, so I think it's something that needs to be monitored in the post uh, higher for longer uh, rate uh, scenario. So, so this would be a longer term risk. Um, so I'm about halfway through. They're the risks, so what are the solutions? So in this intervention, I'm, I'm looking at um, you know, the, the global implications. So of course, the solution is to increase resilience in the economies in emerging markets broadly to global shocks. How can this be done? Well, um, it's you know, very clear that domestic fundamentals are, are very important, but in a, in a world of increasing debt, stocks, it's, it's important to put this debt to productive use. So it's important to um, you know, have growth outcomes for this debt uh, so that it can help to uh, address some of the problems that we see in interest rate growth differentials and bring us more back to what we observed in the pre-pandemic era, which was um, interest rate growth differentials, which were more in line with uh, debt sustainability. I think that transparency on debt exposure is very important. And there are, as I mentioned earlier, there are some 
um, hidden parts of that debt which uh, can affect uh, investor behavior, uh, can affect country risk, and therefore can affect the, the you know, cost of sovereign borrowing, sovereign bar borrowing yields, for example. Um, I think what was discussed earlier uh, by the Bank Indonesia governor was the importance of monetary policy, macroprudential policy, and fiscal policy coordination. Um, I think this will obviously depend on country-specific cir circumstances, the extent to which this can be successful. Um, it will depend on the business cycle, it will depend on fiscal space, monetary policy space, and so on. But I think that um, these factors are clearly very important to um, ensure that economies are resilient to, to global shocks. Um, financial markets have developed very strongly in ASEAN uh, economies over the past 20 years. I mentioned the local currency bond market development. This is, of course, uh, very important. Um, however, you know, what we've seen is that whilst this has helped in terms of um, you know, allowing borrowing in, in local currency, it's really led to re a shift in the currency risk over to the foreign investors. So in order to address those sort of risks and mitigate um, capital outflows as a result of that, it would be important to build greater uh, FX hedging capacities in the region, for example. Um, and related to that, a recalibration of monetary policy tools will be an important factor to uh, underpin resilience and support um, you know, macroeconomic sound frameworks. Um, longer term, there are other structural issues um, on productivity, which will also help to uh, you know, channel debt buildups to productive use. Um, as well as that, there are ongoing uh, risks related to climate, related to geopolitical tensions, um, which need to be managed um, in order to you know, help economies to be more resilient to, to these types of uh, global shocks. And the reason for that is all of these types of shocks if they come at the same time, it will require a very strong uh, you know, macro framework, it will require a very strong uh, prudential framework as well in order to deflect and absorb these types of shocks. Um, I think I can stop there. Thank you very much, uh, John. I cannot disagree more with respect to the importance of fundamentals, domestic uh, fundamentals. But I'd like to pursue later during yeah. the Q&A what you were referring to as the hidden parts in contrast to transparency mm -hmm. in terms of the indebtedness that uh, many of these countries have, have incurred. Th that's a very important uh, point. Okay, let's, let's move on to uh, Min. Yes. Could you okay. pass me the... Thank you. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'd like to touch upon the potential risks also associated with uh, excessive household debt. Uh, which has been highlighted in uh, many countries. And I will briefly uh, introduce the case of Korea in this context. As you may be aware, excessive household debt can lead to a financial crisis uh, through the collapse of the housing market. Uh, instances of uh, financial crisis triggered by uh, excessive debt are not uncommon. So one notable example is the global, finance, uh, global financial crisis of 2008, as you see in the graph. Uh, we sustained a low interest rate and a subsequent rise in housing prices. Households borrowed extensively to purchase homes. And financial institutions actively expanded loans by providing uh, subprime mortgages to households with low credit ratings. However, eventually, uh, starting with the households unable to bear the debt burden, a default on mortgage rate mortgage loans began to spread and leading to the collapse of the housing market and the connecting to the global financial crisis. So if you see the graph of a US case, when the household debt to GDP ratio in the, is exceeded 90%, we can see the decline in the housing prices began. And when it approached 100% in 2008, there was a sharp drop in housing prices resulting in the financial crisis. Uh, similar reasons can be observed in other countries that experienced a financial crisis. In Ireland, for instance, when the household debt to, debt to GDP ratio approached 100%, a decline in housing prices began, 
and in 2010, it reached to 120%, uh, and it led to collapse of the housing market, and they experienced uh, house, uh, financial crisis. So while the threshold level of household debt that triggers a decline in housing prices may vary by country. However, it is evident that excessive household debt eventually uh, leads to a decrease in housing prices and the triggers of crisis. So let me briefly examine the pathway through which excessive household debt becomes uh, linked to a financial crisis. Uh, firstly, excessive household debt higher heightens the risk of household default and constrains economic growth. As the burden of household debt increases, uh, leading to a rise in default rates, the soundness of a financial institution is uh, compromised. Defaults are particularly centered around the financial institutions with a high share of household debt, contribute to the amplification of insolvencies, leading to the spread of a financial instability, and ultimately connecting to a financial crisis. Uh, secondly, household debt, primarily driven by the rise in housing prices, tends to increase. However, when housing prices decline due to the uh, factors such as economic downturns, households face the risk of defaults due to, uh, due to increased financial burdens. This, in turn, triggers a rapid decline in housing prices, uh, sharply contracting the consumption and connecting to an economic downturn. The bankruptcy of some financial institutions as a result of this process can eventually uh, lead to a financial system crisis. Uh, furthermore, a financial system crisis reinforces a risk averse attitude among financial institutions, uh, prompting a sudden contraction in lending. Uh, this credit contraction in turn leads to an economic downturn due to the reduced access to the credit. So in summary, excessive household debt exaggerated the vulnerability of the financial system acting in a way that triggers or amplifies a financial crisis. Uh, therefore, policymakers and uh, financial institutions should proactively formulate uh, various policies uh, considering these dynamics to prevent the adverse effect of excessive household debt and maintain the financial stability. So uh, this household debt issue is not unique to ASEAN three plus three countries. While the ASEAN plus three region enjoys a relatively high economic growth rate, household debt continues to rise. As shown in the graph, though there are no alarming signs, uh, such as a rapid decline in housing prices, household debt is rapidly increasing across all countries. The case of other Asian uh, countries will be elaborated on the, by the next speakers. I would like to focus on the situation in Korea. As a Kevin uh, shows a graph of uh, about the public debt, uh, private debt in, the, in his presentation, uh, actually the, the, for a long time, household debt has been considered a potential risk factor for Korean economy. Although there has been a slight decrease influenced by economic downturns and the high interest rate these days, household debt still remains at a very precarious level. As, of, uh, as you see there, this graph, as of the fourth quarter of 2023, Korea's private credit to GDP ratio stands at a staggering 223%, with the corporate debt at 120% and the household debt at 103%. So corporate debt has been rapidly increasing due to financial institutions expanding corporate loans, and the companies are securing preemptive funding in anticipation of future economic downturns opposing increasing risk. However, today I have for today's discussion, I will focus over on the housing household debt. Uh, Korea's household debt relative to a disposable income is exceptionally high at 161%. So it is currently closely being examined by government from two uh, perspectives. Uh, firstly, the potential for household insolvencies. While 65% of household debt is held by top 30 income households and 24% by the middle income group. However, the concern lies in the fact that the bottom 3% income households still hold 11% of household debt. Considering size of a Korean household debt, this is a very significant figure. 
So recently, with the rising interest rate and the economic downturns, debt burden has increased for these households, leading to a rising uh, delinquency rate in household debt, uh, particularly among non-bank financial institutions, which is a concerning aspect if you, if you see the uh, uh, left bottom uh, graph. Uh, secondly, it is related to the housing market. Around 80% of Korea's household debt comprises housing-related components, including mortgage loans and home purchases and rentals. Uh, so the, uh, although Korea's housing prices have uh, recently shown a declining trend, they still remain very high. So uh, especially, uh, especially in Seoul area, where the price to income rate exceeds the long-term average in the graph in the right bottom graph. Still, although it's uh, some, we see uh, some uh, downward trend, but uh, uh, for Seoul metropolitan area, the housing price is PII is about above 10. But if you look at the only the apartment price in Seoul metropolitan area, especially Seoul area, PIR is reached to like around 18 or 19. So it's very high. So it means that the, uh, the potential for excessive household debt burden to be linked to financial instability through the housing market is a situation that needs careful consideration. And so in line with this, the Korean government is strengthening the macro prudential policies, such as expanding the scope of uh, uh, debt included in the debt to income calculations. Simultaneously, there is a closing monitoring of the trends in housing, household lending by financial institutions and the trajectory of a default rate. Yeah, let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, <clears throat> for walking us through uh, the issue of uh, household debt as it relates to uh, housing prices, mm -hmm. especially in the case of uh, Korea. So while Kevin uh, provided us with the uh, rich background on uh, the issue of indebtedness, and John gave us the global perspective and sectoral uh, analysis was done by uh, Min, we will now hear the experiences of uh, Thailand and then Indonesia in terms of managing this uh, specific issue of debt. Alisara? <coughs> Let me first thank uh, AMRO and ADBI for the opportunity to participate in this very important event. As the previous speaker already mentioned about the debt accumulations in the regions, uh, you can go back to the GFC. My intervention will be focused, uh, go back shorter. You know, I'll just go back to the pre-COVID uh, you know, and compare it, the situation uh, with uh, the current uh, post-COVID uh, uh, situations as the region has accumulated quite a bit of debt uh, during the COVID-19. And despite the economic recovery after the COVID-19, the debt to GDP ratio in several countries, including China, Japan, Korea, and Thailand, remain higher than the pre-COVID levels. And according to the data uh, in the first quarter of the 2023, the debt to GDP ratio of those countries were at least 5% higher than the, quart uh, the fourth quarter of 2019, and this indicating a sustained elevated debt burden. The reason for continued high level of household debt and corporate debt differs across country, but in the case of Thailand, uh, the primary cause are the slow deregulation process together with the sluggish real GDP growth since 2020. As you can see from this slide, um, the level of Thailand private sector debt, both household and corporates, are high. On the household debt, it has increased significantly during the COVID-19 from already a high level. The current level of household debt in Thailand has increased, from six, increased by 6.6% from the pre-COVID level to almost 91% to GDP. And the similar story for co corporate, bo corporate debts. It's also increased noticeably during the COVID-19 pandemic. This elevated uh, private debt is a source of financial sector vulnerabilities 
and could be a drag on the growth. Households with elevated debt are also particularly vulnerable to adverse income shocks. Moreover, high household debt is challenging from a political economy standpoint, at least in the case of Thailand, as many as it may lead to a too generous debt release program, which could create to uh, a moral hazard uh, in the longer term. And in this regard, the high household indebtedness needs to be urgently addressed. On the corporate debt, it reached the peak of 91% uh, of the GDP during the COVID pandemics and has come down slightly to 88% of GDP in the second quarter of 2023. Nevertheless, the non-performing loans from corporate debt barely increased due to effect of debt restructuring, regulatory relaxation measures on loan classifications, and management of NPL on bank books. That said, the high corporate debt also often exert a drag on growth through reduced investments and distort resource allocations. And moreover, new source of risk has emerged in the recent year as large and medium-sized corporations in Thailand shift their financing from bank loan to capital markets financing, resulting in an increasing corporate debt outstanding. Corporate board, actually. This trend has been supported by increasing demand from retail investors as they has been seeking for higher return on their investment, especially during the pre-COVID-19, uh, where the interest rate was very low. We observe a sizable, uh, holding, sizable increase in holding of the high-yield corporate bond by individual investors. Although this holding is still small in relation to the total corporate bond market capitalizations, but the tightening financial condition from monetary policy normalizations could trigger default in high yield bond, dampen market confidence, put pressure on investor wealth, and may create a financial market volatilities. And this create another pocket of risk that could threaten the financial stabilities. We therefore closely monitor the development in corporate debt, especially the debt serviceability of the SME and high yield bond issuers. Regarding the Thailand public debt, which stood at around 62% of GDP this year, although it is at the highest level since 1997, it may not be our most pressing concern, at least in the near term, given Thailand has long maintained a strong fiscal discipline. Our public debt ceiling is higher than our own record, but is still below the average for both developed and ASEAN countries, which uh, are around 120% and 70% of GDP, uh, respectively. In addition, our foreign currency public debt is very low. Foreign participation in the uh, public debt market is also not as high as the other countries in the regions. The maturity of this debt is also quite long. Average time to maturity is about eight years. So the main concern in our case in the near term is the household debt. As the private sector and the household indebtedness could drag growth and threaten financial stabilities, the Thai authority has introduced various measures with an aim to bring down the level of private sector indebtedness to a sustainable level. During the COVID-19 pandemic, these debt release pre uh, measures include liquidity supports and debt restructuring for corporate and household were brought best to help corporate and household that were severely affected from the pandemic. They have become more targeted to most vulnerable households and SME during the, during the post-COVID period. The outstanding, the, with these um, measures, even with these measures, the authority and the authority effort to deal with the household debt issue the household debt in Thailand come down only marginally. To help household sustainably leverage debt and to preempt futures over indebtedness, the Bank of Thailand has recently posed a new set of prudential measures, including responsible guidelines 
to ensure creditors are lending in a responsible and fair manner by providing accurate information, helping not debtor to practice a good financial disciplines, and providing assistance to debtor with persistent debt when needed. Another measure is the risk-based pricing that allow and motivate creditor to charge interest rates according to borrow credit risk to improve loan qualities. Creditor can charge more than previous ceiling of high-risk customer while offering low rates for refinancing of the borrower with the good debt behavior. We are considering also macro potential policy that will offer minimum debt service ratio guidelines to ensure the household maintain appropriate level of uh, a leverage level compared to income. Our initial plan on this uh, debt service ratio is to launch this in 2025, but this subject to consideration sub and also subject to the economic conditions. We are also adopting integrated policy approach to ensure appropriate mix of monetary policy and financial policy. As economy start uh, starting from to recover from the COVID pandemic, monetary policy normalization take a gradual and measured approach. It is to ensure smooth economic takeoff while not added excessive burden on household and firm. Meanwhile, financial policies carefully roll out in line and become more targeted to strike the right balance between growth and financial policy. And as pandemic subsides, we have gradually withdrawn blanket financial support and shift towards more targeted approach to uh, still to still support vulnerable borrowers. For corporate debt, we emphasize on SME debt restructuring and strengthen the corporate bond market functionings, especially on disclosure and the process to deal with uh, distressed debt to protect investor interests. The example of the measure include bondholder representative requirements and the guideline for establishments of the distressed bond fund. My last point is on the public debt. Although I said that it's not our pressing concern, as Thailand public debt level is still manageable, but if there is an increased borrowing from financing future stimulus package from the government, there's a possibility that it will pressure the government bond yield and also the rollover of the corporate bonds. Additionally, changing demographic in Thailand with a rapidly increased elderly population could collectively pose pressure on financial stability and fiscal stability in the long run. Under this backdrop, fiscal discipline and gradual fiscal consolidation are crucial to rebuild fiscal space, uh, to prepare for the future shock and also achieve fiscal sustainability and sustainable growth in the long term. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Alisara, especially uh, emphasizing the need for ensuring debt sustainability and fiscal consolidation. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> can we have your presentation, uh, Bapa Pajono? <laughs> Thank you, Bapa Adifa. Uh, good afternoon. It's very struggling to uh, stay alive in this time. Uh, I will start uh, with Indonesian case perspective, especially when, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Thailand already from the uh, central bank, but uh, from my side, from the fiscal side. Uh, this morning already discussed deeply at least five challenges here uh, for the next year, and also for the current way, higher for longer, geopolitical tension, climate change, digitalization, and pandemics. And uh, in this chart, I just would like to emphasize on the middle charts, even though in uh, moderating, but inflation rate is also projected to stay above the medium term target, at least until the end of the next year. And uh, let me start with Indonesia's perspective. In the midst of the complex situation and a high interest rates environments, it is imperative for countries to strike a delicate balance between maintaining macroeconomic stability, providing well-calibrated fiscal support, and continuing structural reform for a stronger, longer, uh, long-term growth strategy. Prudent fiscal policy needs to be a top priority, given that countries are experiencing increased debt and fiscal deficit compared to 
pre-pandemic levels. In addition, a higher for longer era also requires stronger supervision to safeguard the financial stability. It is also important for countries to continue structural reform to boost their medium term growth. With tight global financial condition, the government needs to explore the potential of domestic resources, mobilization, and seek innovative external financing to navigate the challenging economic situation. Here, uh, from Indonesia experience, we learned that fiscal discipline has been able to anchor our economic stability and robust economic growth. Indonesia has adopted fiscal rule which kept annual fiscal deficit at 3% of GDP and accumulated debt ceiling at 60% of GDP to promote fiscal discipline and sustainability. I don't see any uh, in the radar when Kevin uh, presenting about debt for ASEAN countries, especially Indonesia is not the radar. So this is why. However, the use of this fiscal rule does not necessarily limit the government's room to maneuver when necessary. For example, in the response to the pandemic crisis, we relax the fiscal route, allowing fiscal deficit to go beyond 3% of GDP for only three years, 2020 up to 2022. This temporary relaxations provided government greater flexibility to introduce fiscal stimulus to contain the impact of the pandemic. In 2022, however, the government managed to return its fiscal disciplines to below 3% of the GDP and uh, a year faster than initially planned. Until now, Indonesia debt to GDP ratio remained among the lowest and has trended down since 2022. The Indonesian government has strong commitments to continuously strengthen the national budget to be more effective in responding to economic dynamics, answering challenges, and supporting various development agendas. Therefore, the 2024 budget is directed to at accelerating inclusive and sustainable economic transformation by addressing issues not only in short term but also in medium term perspective. For the short term, the government fiscal policy is focusing on controlling inflation, irrigating extreme poverty, and improving investment, while for the medium term, is focused on improving human capital equality, accelerating infrastructure development, and strengthening institutions' uh, development. On the structural reform, it is uh, the key to escape, especially Indonesia, from the middle income traps. The structural reforms include human capital reform, economic transformation, fiscal reform, and also financial uh, sector reform. Indonesia debt to GDP ratio is much better than peer countries as a result of robust fiscal management. The significance of a robust fiscal position becomes pronounced, particularly in an environment characterized by high debt and soaring interest rates. Prioritizing fiscal sustainability remain at the forefront of Indonesia debt management strategy, marked by commitment to maintaining a debt to GDP ratio at manageable level below 60% of GDP. And uh, you, you just saw before this slide is, is the Indonesia GDP to GDP is around uh, 39%. Much, much room to also mm. maneuver. Mm. Aligning with this commitment is the resolve to sustain a deficit that remains below 3% of the GDP, striking a delicate balance between short-term economic stimuli and long-term fiscal resilience. Central to this strategy is the intricate coordination and strategy, a synergy between fiscal and monetary authorities. Acknowledging the monetary policy decision can affect the interest rate and sustainability of debt. A comprehensive debt management policy is essential to fortify sustainability measures and navigate the intricacies of managing debts effectively. Government commits to strengthen comprehensive debt management policies as follows. Control of debt to GDP ratio by implementing prudent management practices to maintain the debt to GDP ratio within safe limits, calibrated and respond to the evolving dynamic of the economic and financial market. Transparency and disclosure, upholding transparency standard by consistently publishing public information concerning debt management and guarantee obligation, fostering trust and informed decision making. Risk management framework, 
coordinating debt risk management within the framework of safe financial risk management, ensuring a systemic approach to mitigating potential risk. Innovative financing approaches, which promoting creative financing methodologies, including branded financing and non-debt financing sources, schemes, and instruments to diversify funding stream and reduce resilience, reduce reliance solely on traditional debt. And we still have cost-effective debt instruments, which developing debt instruments that strike a balance between minimal cost, control risk, and alignment with market demand, optimizing financial efficiency. Hedging and liabilities management, using uh, hedging strategies and liabilities management to mitigate debt risk and attain an optimized debt portfolio, ensuring a balanced risk exposure. Balanced domestic and foreign financing, with optimizing both domestic and foreign financing sources as complementary revenues, strategically leveraging it to avoid over-reliance on any one sources, and support for development initiative by supporting development financing and program like pre the uh, PINS, uh, economic, National Economic Recovery Program, by providing guarantees while meticulously accounting for associated fiscal risk. And the last, expanding investor base. This is important for Indonesia, which enlarging investor base through educational initiative, enhancing financial literacy, and leveraging investor database to diversify and broaden support for that instrument. By adhering this, uh, this strategic pillars, a holistic debt management policy can be established, reinforcing sustainability efforts and fostering a reliance financial foundation for comprehensive economic development. I stop here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank our uh, panelists for keeping to their time limits so we have more time for questions. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> we encourage everyone uh, to make use of the Slido. We want to solicit as many questions as possible. Uh, as you drop your questions uh, through the Slido, uh, the question will appear before my uh, iPad here. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, let me ask a few questions uh, <clears throat> uh, to our panelists. Well, to Kevin, no? perhaps uh, you will agree with me that uh, the debt crisis of the 1980s in Latin America and some parts of Asia and the European debt crisis in 2009 and 2010 may be different as their causes and extent. But how, in your view, uh, Kevin, will this new debt challenge be resolved? What can we expect in the aftermath? And while you are there trying to uh, you know, formulate your, your answers, can you think of other risks to the global and ASEAN plus three financial stability, ones that you may not have been able to include in your presentation because of time constraints. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. So maybe let me lay out other risks other than that and then yeah. go back to the uh, a potential for a future uh, debt crisis. So um, apart from the high debt, right, uh, there are also other debt that the Asian Plus 3 uh, 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 region is facing and I can think of five uh, debt, uh, five uh, risks. And then the first risk uh, relate to inflation. Inflation has been going down, but it's still above uh, inflation target, and some economies in the region still see the inflation going up. And that, if inflation can come back, that could do to supply, uh, demand, or yeah. geopolitical factors, then can make central banks tight the hand of central banks, uh, and then make it difficult to uh, safeguard financial stability. And that's number one. The risk number two is that uh, there's really a, a lot of uncertainty without, regarding the Federal Reserve's action and partly related to the inflation. And it seems that in the past two years, the market has repeatedly underestimated the hawkishness of the uh, uh, Fed. Yeah. And so, and then if they continue, if, if all of a sudden the Fed continue to uh, uh, hawkish again and now they're become uh, less hawkish now and the market's going up, then if, if the reverse side will see then that will happen, then you can see a major correction in asset prices. 
And that's number two. And number three risk relates to the uh, banking uh, turmoil in the, uh, in, in the United States. Now we see uh, that there was a banking turmoil of UBS and uh, Silicon Valley banks in March. And things have kind of, uh, uh, kind of become more peaceful. But still, you look at the banking stock of the United States, no. it's still below the uh, pre-turmoil uh, uh, level. And in fact, one of the big problems of the banking sector in the United States is that they have a large exposure to commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. And as we know that after the COVID, we don't need to go to the office, we can work from home. <laughs> so the commercial real estate are under stress. And a lot of them also facing competition from MBFIs, so they see their margins. So if that thing uh, happened, they can easily spill over to Asian uh, banks. Even though Asian banks are quite resilient, there could be sentiment with that. And number four is the dollar funding risk. Uh, as you know, that Asia financial transaction depend a lot of dollar. And then dollar, now the liquidity is going down, the US Fed, and also there's like a debt is increasing. Uh, uh, and that, that means there's a lot of dollar. If there's a uh, geopolitical risk or any risk of uh, sentiment, that could easily dry up the liquidity. That can cause problems. And last but not least is the digitalization. Mm -hmm. And now, as you see that in the uh, Silicon Valley banks, now with a click of a button, you can take the money out. Mm -hmm. And then, and this, we have like a Twitter and a rumors going everywhere. And then all this can be driven by false information and they can cause uh, pro uh, problems. So in this, so with that things going uh, uh, in the background, and going back to your uh, potential for risk and how that differ from the past. I would say there's good news and bad news. Mm. The good news is in my uh, presentation I presented, uh, that is like uh, the structure of the debt and also the uh, fundamental things by sound that kind of mitigate the systemic ri uh, uh, risk. But then the, the bad news is what I just explained about those debt. <laughs> and on top of that, there are also other caveats of my presentation. And then let me uh, highlight a few. Number one, um, in my presentation, I was doing really high-level regional uh, 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 perspective. So here, in a very high, uh, uh, 5,000 feet up, you see everything looks good. But then if you look at more granular, think, think of an example. For example, I think, I think housing. I said that, that things are quite along, uh, in line with fundamentals on the regional uh, perspective. But if you look at, say, if a big country, even if you look at the aggregate, the, the housing price looks OK. But they could be regional, okay. uh, a park kind of risk there. Yeah. And then those can easily uh, be problematic. That's number one. And number two is the data. And I think go to Eddie's issue here. Yeah. A lot, there's like a lot of MBFIs, and, and they, the data are missing. So, um, uh, and also household debt. We don't have good data. So although I presented some very beautiful pictures that show pretty good, but the ugly pictures are not being presented because the data are not available. <laughs> they might be hidden because the data is not available. And then last but not least, the world has become more complicated because of MBFI, digitalization, yeah. and all the uncertainty that I mentioned. So the risk could even be bigger, and it's hidden. It's low visibility. And let's go back to the... Uh, the, the, the theme, right? Navigating high debt in low yeah. visibility. So what I hope, uh, that a lot, the last sentence I want to say is that my presentation mm -hmm. showed you guys that there's no need for, to panic. However, the caveat I mentioned, that means that there's no room for complacency. Correct. Mm -hmm. That's in your stress testing, yes. um, what's the probability of, uh, let's say, too much uh, increase in interest rate? I mean, you were, you were shocking yeah, the system, yeah. right? That is another caveat too, because we, yeah. we are looking at the, we are- So what we, kind of interest yeah, rate do you put 350 basis point, 3.5. 3.5. So if you assume, a, a, say, 10 or 20, <laughs> then you can still, you can definitely uh, collapse system. That, that's the other key too. But we don't think, if you look at the interest rate yeah. increase in the Asia is not as much as uh, elsewhere. So we thought that now is uh, the end of the uh, interest rate hike. Yeah, you're right, that's another caveat. We only shocking 350 the most. If you go like a 10, 20, that can easily collapse the system. Okay. Well. You do 100, 1,000, you die. Everything would die. Okay. Thank you very yeah, much, Kevin. Very much. Let's yes. move on to uh, let's move on to John. John, you were saying something that is not uh, transparent, mm -hmm. hidden uh, parts <clears throat> about uh, the indebtedness. Uh, can you can you elaborate on that, please? 
Yes, well, <laughs> I mentioned about the non-bank finance yeah. issue and um, that it is a key source of funding of external debt for many economies. Um, now, one of the issues around the non-bank uh, finance sector is that there is a lack or relatively less transparency mm. in the degree of exposure. Um, and, you know, all we know is that there is less transparency and there's some hidden levels of debt. Um, by definition, we don't know um, how much because it's hidden. Um, but the problem with this is that um, it creates uncertainty in markets, right? So, and when there's uncertainty in markets, it tends to be amplified when there's tension in markets or uh, a degree of um, amplified uh, stress in markets, such as what we see at the moment. Um, and as a result of that, it can lead to increases in country risk, it can lead to increases in government bond yields, therefore increases in sovereign risk. And this, of course, um, then has spillovers to debt sustainability risks, risks of debt distress, the types of problems that we're discussing on this panel. Um, so I think it's difficult to, to really quantify it by definition. Uh, there, there's a degree of uh, unknown with the, the level of, of, of uh, debt exposure. Um, and it's something that is also a concern at the cross-country level. So, How do you propose to address this issue of uh, non-transparency? Because we need data, right? We need information precisely yeah. to uh, determine the extent of vulnerability. Exactly. Well, I mean, I think uh, the authorities are coming together to address this issue. The BIS and the FSB are, yeah. are central to addressing some of these data gaps. Um, it will take time, of course, before we get a handle on uh, the, the level of the exposures and also uh, a comparability of these data exposures across countries, which is also very important. All we know is that uh, the level of exposure has increased over time. We don't know the exact amount. We know yeah. that um, when there's a period of financial stress in markets, there can be much more volatility. And when there's volatility, that's never a good uh, sign. Um, if you're lucky, there's just volatility and it will go away. Mm. If you're not lucky, uh, the volatility will lead to an increase in uh, yield, increase in country risk, and sovereign risk, as I said. And, and this, is, this is not what we want in, in the current environment, of course. Thank you. During this morning's uh, session one, um, there was the point that was made, and I think it resonated in many of the um, presentations uh, during the morning session, that the benefits of uh, addressing climate change far outweigh the costs. And I don't think this is uh, debatable. But uh, public climate finance relies heavily on public debt, which amounts to about 70% of the total public debt, 70% uh, <clears throat> of GDP, according to the United Nations. Um, and high and growing debt levels may constrain the prospects of growth in the ASEAN plus three uh, um, economies. Now, uh, what steps can countries take to continue advancing climate-related initiatives if there will be consequences on the uh, prospects of uh, economic growth? John? Very good question. Um, I think this issue of um, climate change and sovereign risk, this is something that we've been looking at at the yeah. ADBI before the pandemic even. So looking at the extent to which climate vulnerability can lead to an increase in the cost of sovereign borrowing. And we find that for economies that are highly exposed to the effects of climate change, they face the largest premium on their sovereign bond yields. And this is a real challenge for policymakers because these are the exact economies that are in most need of investment in adaptation and mitigation. What can we do in the current environment? Well, <laughs> over the past number of years, the debt exposure, the stock of debt has increased significantly, so it has even increased further the pressure on these economies. What can we do? Um, I think you know there's a limit to what uh, public policy can do by yeah. itself, but it can act as a, an important catalyst for leveraging private sector participation and private sector investment um, in climate adaptation, climate mitigation, for example. And, and that's something that um, will be a, an important factor which can be brought into regional cooperation, for example, yeah. to lay the groundwork for enhanced um, private sector investment generally, and also at, at a more specific level to you know, enable the private sector to understand risk-adjusted returns, 
um, related to uh, sustainable development type projects over the longer term, which can be beneficial for them um, in terms of their profitability, in terms of their revenue stream, and in, in terms of um, diversifying their e exposure to shocks at the, at the firm level. So I think that's, you know, recognizing that we have um, limits on public policy in terms of the level, but also recognizing that it can be uh, used as an important lever for introducing uh, private sector participation in these types of projects will be a very important uh, factor mm -hmm. going forward. Okay, thank you very much, Jan. Let me, let me move on to, uh, to me, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, one possible implication of uh, the debt problem, as you uh, mentioned earlier, is the impact on households and the subsequent effects on, and this is uh, more macro, personal consumption, the housing market, etc. Is this something you think is increasingly becoming a regional issue? How pervasive is this in the ASEAN plus three mm. region? Well, I think uh, the, uh, I do not consider the household debt issues as an extremely uh, critical, crucial factor for Asian prospect reasons mm. at the present. It is true that the uh, concerns are growing. And uh, given the variation in economic conditions on the housing, you know, uh, financial structures and uh, the debt and uh, asset structure of households among different countries, I think uh, making a blanket judgment is challenging. However, uh, considering the uh, many Asian plus the countries generally possesses uh, economic structures uh, very vulnerable to the both domestic and the international shocks. So I think uh, I believe it's uh, crucial to closely monitor international financial movement and the uh, interest rate movement and then they also enhance their economic resilience by taking effort to the, uh, mitigate, the, uh, mitigate the uh, side effect. And then I think uh, the, uh, the other thing we think about is the, uh, I think uh, uh, nowadays uh, this current high interest rate environment is perceived as a kind of, kind of potential risk for Asian plus mm -hmm. countries. So over pathway contribute to the, uh, this primarily because the emerging economies are uh, really significantly on the external borrowings. So high interest rate increased borrowing costs, especially impacting the countries with a high proportion of uh, foreign uh, currency denominated debt. Then capital outflows to high interest rate countries like uh, America these days, then can trigger currency depreciation, so intensifying uh, inflationary pressures and uh, escalating the repayment cost of uh, foreign currency denominated debt. So uh, at the national level, the increased burden of debt repayment could pose a challenge for fiscal policy uh, because uh, it will potentially limit the implementation of uh, economic uh, stimulus or uh, social welfare programs. And I think a central bank may also face uh, policy dilemmas because you know, they have to maintain the high interest rate and uh, to tackle the housing price housing market and uh, some household debt. But however, this kind of policy will dampen the economic you know, growth. So they will have uh, some, you know, they should control the which, the, uh, pro uh, which goal is, you know, they are the primary goals or not. And uh, additionally, there is a risk of a side effect as a uh, weakened investment consumption, uh, increased financial market volatility among others. And then, so I think uh, each country is an Asian plus, uh, Asian plus three consider this risk along with uh, their uh, unique economic conditions, uh, policy, policy framework, and the uh, external volatilities uh, and uh, you know, particular, so, yeah. DJ Alisara earlier on made reference to the uh, political economy uh, aspect of, uh, of indebtedness, especially on household debt. Is this true also in Korea? Are there, uh, are you seeing some implications on uh, both social and uh, political uh, dynamics in, in Korea? Precisely because of uh, yeah, increasing uh, household debt. Yeah, these days uh, housing prices in Korea yes. is especially very high. Mm. So it means that there are some kind of polarization in housing conditions for yeah. people. So if you, if you consider the Seoul area, like average, uh, house which can buy uh, you know medium like a medium term medium income households can buy a medium priced house they should wait like 15 years mm. to buy to you know to the, uh, save all the money they earned so 
in this case, it's, it's um, impossible, actually. And then mm -hmm. the Korean government used LTV regulation as a tool to control the housing market and the household debt. Some, over several years ago, when the housing market in the uh, boom, and then they, uh, when the government worried about household debt and the housing prices, they, they set the uh, uh, LTV ratio at the 40%. Mm -hmm. At a uh, limit of uh, some certain the area of Seoul, and 50% uh, is general. So you know the 40% of LTV it means that you need a lot of money to buy a house, <laughs> right? But uh, this year, when the uh, government worry about the uh, other way, so they increase the LTV to 70%, mm. some, somewhere you know, to 80%. So the uh, Polish production is uh, very you know, fluctuating. Very and so it means that, but however, the, although the housing price is too high and the LTV is a very strictly regulated uh, in Seoul area, you know, mostly about 50% to 60%, it means that the uh, lower income household cannot buy a house. Mm. So it gives a lot of political pressure and the social yeah. pressures to, yeah, to Korea. Thank you very much, Min. Yeah, <clears throat> for Alisara, no? I also asked uh, Kevin about this, uh, mm. but you have been seen uh, the Asian financial crisis of 1997-1998. I think uh, you were in the trading room at the time. Uh, how would you, how would you, you know, uh, appreciate the fact that um, uh, the potential risks, okay, about the, um, I know Thailand has gone a long way since uh, the Asian financial crisis, uh, but would you like to tell us whether uh, this current uh, debt challenge, uh, you know, um, facing uh, Thailand and of course uh, the region, is something also similar in the 1990s. In what way uh, was is it is it different, and uh, what is it, what seems to be the dynamics driving uh, uh, the debt issue now in in Thailand? Uh -huh. Well, I see the current debt situation as was nothing like. It was in 26 years ago when the Tham Yung Kung crisis struck Thailand and led to the flotations of the Thai baht in July 1997. During that time, the external positions of Thailand was very weak with high external foreign currency debt. Mm. Unlike the 1997, currently Thailand external position is strong as in the second quarter of 2023, our net reserve stood at around uh, close to 250 billion US dollars as compared to just slightly below 40 billion in 1997 before the crisis strike, struck the Thailand. And our international reserve to short-term debt currently were around 2.7 times rising from below one times in 1997. And the net imports uh, of 10 months is also a lot higher than during the Tom Yam Kung crisis. So the key is also the external position. The strong external positions is important. But also, the current account deficit is a lot less. Um, we also still have the current account deficits of around 3% in 2022, but compared to before the crisis, during the 1997, the current account deficit was 8% of GDP, which is way uh, above uh, the current level. And uh, tourist, tourism uh, developments uh, and the improvement in the uh, current account uh, deficits next year, this year and next year, would be able to uh, help uh, boosting the external, step, uh, external positions. And we expect it, the current account to turn surplus next, uh, this year about 1%, and next year, uh, you know, we expect it to be 1.7% surplus. So this would also help uh, our external position. And more importantly, the exchange rate regime is difference. It was fixed exchange rate regime in 1997. Now the regime changed to floating uh, exchange rates. 
which allow the action web to become automatic stabilizer for uh, to tackle the imbalances from the external front. And it still allowed uh, room for the central bank to come in uh, to manage excessive volatilities through the market mechanism if needed. Um, the other point that are very different is also the banking sector. The banking sector now a lot stronger, you know, with the strong financial positions and the uh, uh, supervisions, uh, in it, uh, financial uh, uh, supervisions uh, standards and guidelines are a lot stronger. So this thing combined would make it a lot different from what we have seen in 1997. But current situation is also very challenging, uh, you know, especially uh, in the case of household debt. It might not become like, you know, abrupt crisis, but it drag growth. The long-term growth would, you know, uh, becoming challenging, you know, with this high household debt. And also this high household debt uh, also created a pocket of risk. If there is a change in, you know, maybe external factor or let's say supply shock, it becoming vulnerable and threaten the financial stabilities. That's why there's a quite a big dynamics yeah. from, from uh, you know, the external risk capital outflows to more of the domestic uh, uh, risk and vulnerabilities from the household debt. And I want the other thing that I would want to add, which is, uh, you know, a quite a big change, um, it's good and bad thing because, you know, from the 1997, we see a big, good developments in the financial market, especially the local funding, local corporate bonds. Uh, as we see a shift, you know, and, and you know, increasing bond, corporate bond outstanding. But then it creates another pocket of risk where when there's a search for you pre-COVID uh, 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 period, there's a shift of investments of the institutions as well as the retail individual investor to the corporate bond markets. And it's now creating a bit of a pocket of risk uh, in our case. That's why strengthened uh, market functioning and uh, you know, disclosures and also the facilities uh, and two market tools to, uh, to help the market clearing of the, the corporate debt distress would be important as well as the financial literacy of the retail investors. Earlier in your presentation, uh, we know that uh, Thailand has been uh, um, undertaking a lot of measures, particularly potential measures, precisely to address the buildup of uh, financial stress and in the process uh, promote uh, financial stability. Are you planning on more potential measures in the future? Yeah, that's what I just yeah. mentioned, you know, earlier, the responsible lending, yeah. the, uh, um, the, debts, uh, the, yeah, the, the responsible lending, the uh, risk-based pricing, that's two uh, prudential policy that we want, to, uh, in, we want to introduce next year, early next year, to ensure that, uh, you know, sustain the leveraging in the household sector and also to prevent the indebtedness in the futures. The other thing that we're still considering, as I mentioned, is yeah. the, uh, the debt service ratio. That one is you know, something that we, we would need to consider uh, and the implementation might be, have to be appropriate with the economic conditions. That's maybe three main things. Um, in addition to that, we, we always promote the debt restructuring uh, process. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Alisara. So uh, let's move on to uh, Baba Panjono. <laughs> well, due to the surge in short-term financing during the pandemic, the gross financing needs of most uh, ASEAN plus three governments are projected to remain high in the next uh, few years. And I think the numbers we show that. How should this temporarily elevated public sector refinancing need to be managed to ensure smooth functioning of financial markets and also improve the public debt structure, at least in Indonesia? Sure. Thank you, Diva. So 
Yeah, the search in the short term uh, uh, financing during the pandemic uh, actually has uh, increased the uh, gross uh, financing for most uh, countries in the ASEAN plus three. And uh, certainly this, uh, uh, which means uh, in the currently, uh, country government should uh, borrow more money to finance the, uh, the matures of uh, debt and also the financing the running uh, deficits. And uh, certainly also this could uh, expose the refinancing risk if the current condition of high interest rates and also the, uh, also the sentiment uh, market uh, deteriorate. So, so that's why uh, Indonesia take, uh, um, see this is uh, essential to manage the, uh, this temporarily elevated public uh, sector financing needs in a prudent and sustainable way. Uh, one that the government of Indonesia take is with the uh, uh, fiscal consolidations, which uh, I saw all in presentation, very disciplined Indonesia keep the uh, deficit or lowering deficit whenever the uh, situation allow, uh, allowed and also stabilize the debt to GDP ratio so that it will give the more uh, room for maneuver and also the, the fiscal space and that uh, way. Uh, fiscal consolidation also giving the uh, signal to the market that uh, the government uh, has uh, really committed and also uh, a government also has a credibility in uh, maintaining the, the, the sound resilience as well as on the uh, prudence uh, uh, manage, uh, management of the uh, situation. So uh, certainly the, this main, uh, sound political policy would could enhance also the confidence of the market as well as on the uh, investor. Uh, I also already saw in the, in the presentations uh, uh, we have uh, relaxed uh, for three years uh, beyond 3%, but then we already return back during only two mm. years uh, below uh, 2% of uh, deficit. And uh, secondly, uh, this year, uh, our, 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 our budget allowing us to have 2.85% uh, of deficit, but then our prognosis of this year uh, 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 gives the number of 23 percent of uh, uh, debt uh, to uh, a deficit on the fiscal side. So uh, it, this will facilitate uh, more room for the fiscal side and also giving the signal for the investor and market on the confidence that uh, the government really managed the situation. Well, I don't want to ask this, but I want to hear it from you. You know, we recall the sad experience of Indonesia during the 1990s, when then IMF uh, managing director Michel Kamdezou, was photographed <laughs> looking over the shoulder of then President Sukarno, Suharto, arms folded, signing a package of austerity measures imposed by the IMF. With your assessment of the policies Indonesia has been pursuing all these years, and they are good, okay? Uh, I, we have to admit <laughs> that uh, Indonesia is doing a good job. Would you say IMF support will ever be needed again? <laughs> That's a very provocative question. <laughs> I also asked with my Korean colleagues that uh, oh, that was not a uh, Korean uh, crisis, that was IMF crisis. <laughs> but the player is there, Pak Padiva, we have uh, Pak Budi. <laughs> but actually, uh, uh, 97, 98 crisis is very, really painful for Indonesia. Yeah. And uh, the other side, we, we use every case of incident of crisis for the reforms. Mm. Uh, we. Uh, we had 97 crisis after just after we had a, a decade of more than 6% growth, right? So readiness, what Alisara mentioned, matters there. And then uh, we, we did many and undertaken many reform after that. And I think uh, uh, this is the, the, the thing that we prepare for and learn from the lesson from the crisis. And we had several episodes of crisis after that, 98, uh, 2008, a uh, global financial crisis and then 2013, table bedroom. And the last time we just had uh, actually the pandemic, so it's really mm. hard. But in every case, an incident of issue of the crisis, Indonesia always takes the, uh, I mean, uh, reform on that way. The last pandemic, you can see uh, what, what, the, what the reform that made omnibus law, and so mm. also the downstreaming industry on the nickel and mineral and many things. So uh, having said that, uh, during the pandemic also, IMF press Indonesia, already uh, have uh, what uh, best policy response during the, during the pandemic crisis. And I think with the uh, deficit only 2.3 in our prognosis and also the growth 
five percent in this current situation and more, expecting more, then I don't see any. I mean, the possibility to again come to IMF is very low. But uh, my my friend in, in Bank Indonesia will see no. <laughs> well, very good to hear that. Huh? Very good to hear that. And uh, by the way, uh, we received three questions from Slido. Uh, number one, can Asian uh, EM rates stay below U.S. rates over the medium term amidst a continued strong U.S. dollar? Who would like to take that? Well, John? I okay, okay. Alisada first. Yeah, I'll well, just, you know... I might not give the, the you know directly to the answer, but just give you the example of what has been, what has happened in the past uh, two years after uh, post COVID for Thailand. You know, Thailand is kind of lack, uh, lack guard in terms of the economic recovery, yeah. as, especially as compared to the advanced country. And uh, once we start to recover, policy normalization start. There are a lot of analysts, you know, they are just looking at the interest rate differential between Thailand and the U.S. Mm. And, you know, criticizing us as uh, maybe, you know, uh, behind the curve kind of uh, thing on the monetary policy. But what, what happened during that time that, you know, it, it was high uh, inflation where, you know, inflation in Thailand go up to like 8%. But what we perceived during that time uh, was that this is more of the supply shock. With a slow growth and slow domestic demand in Thailand during the, the uh, early episode of the recovery, this high inflation will subsequently subside. So instead of taking uh, the, uh, the high interest rates uh, approach like the other country, uh, especially the advanced country, we, take, we took the more of the gradual and measures uh, monetary policy. And it seemed to be the right approach. Uh, our inflation come down to the target in seven, about seven, eight months. And the current situation would be very challenging if we took you know, that advanced economy approach because you know, we didn't see uh, the strong growth. Our growth is more of the moderate recovery uh, and a lot of uncertainty and bumpers. So it proved to be something uh, that, uh, you know, we, we proved to be quite a right approach. During that time, the experience that we have on the capital outflow is quite, uh, quite significant as well. But we do use other tools. We use market mechanism, you know, uh, manage excessive volatility and around the exchange rate to adjust. And the other important thing is we communicate to the market. We tell the corporates that there are more volatility, so the corporate need to hedge their effect exposures. And how was your core inflation during that time? Um, it's quite high as well, but not as high as... as the headline. Yeah, the headline. I okay. Uh, John, you, you have something to add? Yes, I think when we talk about emerging markets, it's obviously yeah. a, a huge group of different economies. Mm. Um, so. As well as that, it's important to bear in mind that many of the emerging markets in Asia, in ASEAN, are very close to neutral rates already. Mm -hmm. So this is not like the case in the US where a much longer period of uh, high rates is necessary uh, in order to fight the inflation. Um, on the emerging market side, it's also an important factor to bear in mind that the growth impact needs to be balanced against the price stability impact. And inflation is, you know, coming down in, in ASEAN, if we're going to talk about ASEAN. Um, and, you know, tightening rates would clearly be detrimental to growth, even though it would narrow the differential between the U.S. and, uh, and emerging markets, it would be detrimental to growth. So I think when economies are deciding about uh, the interest rate, it's necessary to take into account domestic factors domestic inflation balanced against the growth outlook. Mm. Um, and, you know, what happens in the U.S. happens in the U.S. That has to be dealt with. You yeah. know, we will look at the differential and there will be some inevitable uh, capital flow reactions. But, you know, ultimately it's, it's a domestic uh, a national uh, decision that needs to be made. Thank you. Now, the next question is addressed to Min. The question is, is there any correlation between high 
loan levels to housing developers with housing price declines? Excuse me. Okay. Mm -hmm. The question is this. Is there any correlation between high loan levels, high loans, high loans yeah. to housing developers with housing price declines? Yeah, uh, there are some, these days uh, there are lots of problems in the project financing and especially for the you know, developers who borrowed a lot of money from bank and yeah. the security, uh, security companies for developing the, uh, some house complex and some buildings. But nowadays, because of uh, the housing market is downturn and because of high interest rate, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, project financing can fall into the default. However, uh, but the uh, value of uh, default uh, from, from the uh, project financing uh, is not uh, you know, great, I mean, cons considerable value. But however, the project financing is uh, very in uh, bad shape and the government want to try to guarantee some, you know, to, to project financing companies and developers to extend their loans to when the economy is, you know, some improve the later. But, However, still, a lot of some, some part of us, not in Seoul area, some local part of us, uh, Korea, they are, because of uh, you know, the uh, uh, population decreasing uh, and then some uh, polarization in the, some local areas. So uh, some developers in the, those areas are facing a lot of problems. But it, it also the, uh, affect the housing market prices in local area, not in Seoul area. Thank you very much, uh, Min. The last three questions are all for Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> First question, how much of the regional increase in household debt during COVID can be attributed to China? Did household debt increase more in economies with less household support? You can, you can pass if you don't have the data. Uh, I, I don't have the data offhand. Uh, but, uh, but actually, China, uh, household debt is not so much, like, uh, at least like, uh, relatively, it's not that high for, for China. It may more corporate debt than, yeah. than the household debt. So, but anyway, I don't, I don't know how much is it. But we, have, we can certainly have the data. We can do some calculation. OK. Second question. How are different ASEAN plus three countries navigating the current global economic and financial environment? I think this question was answered by Many. almost everyone. Yeah. Yeah. But would you like to try it again? So what is the question again? <laughs> how, how, how what? How are different ASEAN plus three countries navigating the current global economic and financial environment? A very general question, Yeah. Okay. admittedly. Um, I mean, as a whole, I mean, the ASEAN plus three economies are uh, navigating better than, than other uh, region, um, and partly because of the uh, good fundamental, the, the reserve cover, uh, uh, like reserve buffer, policy buffer, they have been built since the Asian financial crisis. So yeah. in general, they, they're doing better. Of course, there is uh, uh, differences across, and some um, are facing uh, various issues, some are having a uh, different debt issue, and some have inflation. Uh, that's clearly above the target and uh, uh, pick up. And some have deflation, like China, and, uh, uh, and some other have uh, deflation. So I think that it's, it's quite different. But uh, generally speaking, they are navigating uh, quite well and in this uncertainty. But of course, they all have uh, some common challenges, such as uh, they, uh, they may have some debt issue. They also have some uncertainty with uh, uh, like uh, a Federal Reserve uh, action, capital flows, etc. But um, yeah, so and and also maybe I want to comment on the uh, earlier question that you have about how much Asia can can afford to have a uh, interest differential. Yeah. Uh, and I think I cannot agree yeah. more with John in the in the sense that I think that one very different now uh, for Asia than 20 years ago is that Asia is a lot stronger. They have much buffer, more reserves. So Asia can do their own thing, you know, can look at their own fundamental. And then if you say that the interest rate has to follow the United States, that means you actually you are saying that we are packing the exchange rate with the United States, which may not be uh, uh, sensible because there are different uh, business cycles, synchronization. We may not, maybe Asia are more synchronized 
among themselves, say with China, with Japan, one of them in the United States. So that I agree with John that because, and also because not only because we have to do what we have to do, and that's what he said, but also because we are also able, we can do what we can do because simply because we're stronger, we're healthier, and have stronger buffers. Okay, before I ask the last question, maybe I can uh, direct also the second question to uh, Baba Parjono. The second, the second question I address to, uh, uh, to Kevin is this, and I will contextualize this and, uh, and uh, do this in the, in the case of Indonesia. How is Indonesia navigating the current global economic and financial environment? You have, you have answered this, but perhaps you can reiterate in a, in a more compressed way, uh, Baba Parjono. <laughs> Actually, my presentation already very compressed, but <laughs> yeah, uh, I think uh, the first is coordination between uh, yeah. fiscal and monetary side should be very, I mean, uh, close and uh, tighter. And that be that uh, uh, we have deficit, but uh, and also we are looking financial uh, liquidity from the market, and we support each other in that way. And uh, many uh, policy we, uh, I mean, uh, discuss together. For example, on how we proceed with the export uh, fund is what uh, proceed and also in terms of the how oh, actually we uh, on the don't sleeping industry that uh, uh, in other side from the fiscal supporting the monetary uh, soundness or from also from the monetary also supporting what actually the room that fiscal should uh, so uh, I mean uh, others already explained but uh, coordination between the uh, fiscal and monetary is really matters on that way. Thank you very much uh, Pajono. So <clears throat> The last question goes to Kevin, but everybody please uh, uh, contribute to the discussion, okay? The question is this, how significant is exchange rate volatility for bank and NBFIs stability in the region, in particular those with high foreign exchange liabilities? So, maybe let me start. Um, yeah, let, yeah. Let, let's, uh, let's keep it short. Okay. <laughs> In general, say for public debt, I mean, like uh, yeah. most of them have uh, local currency uh, issuance. Uh, some countries have more uh, 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 government, uh, so it's FX denominated, so they have a bigger problem. Now, corporate debt, there are some that also have the uh, 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 foreign uh, uh, FX denominated debt, and those have certainly face more problems. But fortunately, they are not the majority of it. So, in my view, it is a cause of concern, but it's probably not a cause for panic because it's not a majority of the debt. But there's certainly a certain pocket of economy, some corporate sector, particularly those that have uh, income in local currency, but they issue uh, foreign debt. That would be uh, uh, problematic. Okay. But I don't see a systemic problem. Okay, John, you like to yes, take uh, it up? Just following on from what Kevin said, I yeah. think that you know, whenever there's volatility in markets, it's generally not a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you know, mm -hmm. it would be really um, impacting those economies that have high shares of foreign currency denominated debt in yeah. this case, if we're talking about exchange rate volatility. So in the case of ASEAN economies, I think this risk is a little bit more muted given the presence of local currency bond markets and the lower uh, share of uh, exposure to dollar denominated debt, for example. So I think that exchange rate volatility is probably less of a concern for ASEAN economies. It's more of a concern, certainly, for Latin American economies, for yeah. example. Okay, Min? Yeah, I think that it's just a concern these days. But however, the Asian countries have experienced the Asian financial crisis in what, 25 years ago, and then they got a lot of lessons mm. from the incident. So I think the private sector and public sector government, they have managed, you know, they have set up kind of a you know, good system to, to face the uh, external exchange rate of volatility. And uh, so I think uh, they will do very well. <laughs> and then, you know, with the cooperation of uh, our countries, I think. Okay, Alisara? Yeah. Yeah, uh, for Thailand, I think you know it's quite like Korean, you know, Thai corporates now uh, they had learned that lesson. It's very, you know, difficult time for them during 1997. So most of their, I think, most of their foreign currency debt fully hedged back to the local currency. 
but it's still something that uh, you know we cannot be complacent in this uh, case because the implication of exchange rate volatilities and the capital flows for op small open economy is quite excessive if we are too complacent. So two key uh, things uh, that we learned from 1997 crisis. First is about both. And second is uh, you know, to let the corporates and the, the, all parts of the, the market, uh, stakeholder in the economy manage their effect risk appropriately. So it's uh, the message from the central bank very often and consistently you know, tell the corporates that they have to manage their effect exposure. Thank you, Alisara. Yeah. Yeah. Bala Yeah, Indonesia has, uh, has very strong committee. We call it a uh, financial stability committee that consists of central bank, uh, Ministry of Finance, and then the guarantee uh, insurance as well as on the financial supervisor. Uh, and, and that way, we uh, very active communicate what happening with the uh, policy makers, with the private. So everything is just transparent. Uh, private knows what actually from the policy maker is not doing. This is, I mean, important, especially when the I mean, situation not uh, many mentioned about the creating not panic and everything. So it's very open, and we prudently with the committee uh, manage the, the situation. Okay. <clears throat> Let me wrap up by thanking our uh, expert panelists for walking us through the dynamics of uh, increasing uh, debt and its implications on financial stability. We thank them for the rich background, for the global perspective that the challenge may not be confined in the ASEAN plus three economies. We thank them for focusing on the various sectoral impacts, especially on the households and uh, the housing market. We thank them for the enlightening discussion on the country experiences, particularly in Thailand and Indonesia, and the most important, the policy implications. Okay? So <clears throat> I think um, the view that uh, this session is also very enlightening is shared by uh, everyone. So uh, can we give them a round of applause?